silent. Good evening, I'm Tom Fenton, and we're here tonight to, uh, to celebrate a, a really brilliant little book. Thank you. I read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too, once or twice. Which uh, distills all the hard-won information that most of us learn from <coughs> older and wiser colleagues or, or the very hard way in the field. And I, I recommend this to absolutely anyone who's interested in a career in journalism or who's simply interested in the news and wants to be able to, to read it and dissect it intelligently. Mort Rosenblum is one of the world's most experienced foreign correspondents. He has, as a special correspondent for the Associated after Press, him. After, after him. Well, no, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he has been just about everywhere, absolutely everywhere, both in the field and um, as an editor, a one-time editor of the, uh, the International Herald Tribune in, in Paris. And I, I've known him since his early Paris days. John Swain is a, one of the very best of the Sunday Times correspondents, and he, he made a reputation with the Sunday Times in, during the Indochina War. He is a foreign correspondent out of central casting. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it, 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 it took an actor to, to play the role of him in the 1984 Oscar-winning film, The Killing Fields. Mort is one of my heroes because he not only is one of the, the best practitioners in this little band of brothers that call themselves foreign <coughs> correspondents, but he, like all of us, he cares about the news, and not only cares, but is, d is doing his best to hold back the tide of bad practice, celebrity news, and all the rest that is squeezing out real news from our daily news diet. So, I, Mort, I assume that's why you wrote this book. I mean, it is, it is. I, I, in fact, I'm not gonna read at you for a while, but there's a couple of graphs that explain exactly why I did write the book. Um, <clears throat> back in the uh, photo technology, this is how the book starts, a couple of graphs. Back in the photo, in the proto, back in the proto technology days when foreign correspondents spent weeks out of touch with their desks, I asked friends what advice editors had offered them as they headed out on their first assignment. Bob Sullivan is a kid off to an ugly war taking shape in Vietnam for United Press International went to a promising source. His foreign editor, a gravelly voiced, gray-haired legend named Walter Logan, had been everywhere. Cotton underwear, Logan said. <laughs> <laughs> Nylon clings in the tropics. <coughs> um, I got in a fight with Nick Kristoff over this. Kristoff Chris always wears nylon underwear so he can wash it fast and get on a plane, but um, <laughs> cotton. Um, that was it. The Oracle's wisdom was limited to avoiding sweaty privates. <laughs> As Logan came up with something, pra but at least Logan came up with something practical. Others' wisdom was basically keep your head down, which is no way to watch news take shape. Um, today, guidance is more vital than ever. At the extreme, it can save lives. It saves lives. It can mean the difference between inspired insight and getting things dead wrong. Yet it's hard to find. Fewer editors have been there themselves. Seasoned hands write great books, but not many explain the basics. Heroic memoirs come from TV and online celebrities. Um, this is the manual I wish I'd had back in the 60s when I was dropped into Congolese mayhem, clueless, sleepless, and scared witless. Much of the Congo spoke French, but I didn't. So my sister Jane was only half joking, said, well, you have to say the guy's dead because you don't know the word for wounded. Um, <laughs> with a measure of luck, I <coughs> emerged intact, but my work, not to put too fine a point on it, was pathetic. Um, trial and error is no way to cover events that help take shape, that, that, that help shape the course of a planet. Um, now I'll come back to that because that's really kind of my theme. This is also the primer I wish people back home could have had at hand as they puzzled over our dispatches and watched television newscasts. However good correspondents might be, 
distant readers and viewers tend to miss the point unless they understand the process of news gathering. In a changed world, we need new frames of reference. Hardly anything now remains within boundaries. Us and them are over. The internet <coughs> removes these lines that once separated domestic and foreign news. Hits come from everywhere. Post something about Brazilians or Britons in Fargo, North Dakota, and you might hear from lawyers in Rio de Janeiro or Manchester. And then it goes on. But after a few hours in the damp rag climate of the Congo, I figured out undergarments on my own. During the years that followed, I have thought a lot about the rest of it. In short, the essence is this. Reporters must get up the road. And if possible, they should be there before the story is a story. If they're not there, neither are we. So that's why I wrote it. That's, that's the essence of it. Well, you now teach journalism among, among doing other things. What do you tell wannabes about the possible future they may have? Things look so bleak in this broken business model of, of news. Why in the world would anyone want to be a journalist? And, and what do you say to uh, kids who ask you uh, uh, what their future chances are? Well, if they ask me things like, do you have to make your own hotel bookings, I tell, <laughs> I tell them to be an orthopedic <coughs> surgeon. But um, <coughs> funnily enough, I mean, as pathetic as our profession is today, it's never been so easy for somebody with real, um, you know, real, a certain amount of courage, but mostly just curiosity and ambition and drive to go out and do this stuff. I mean, you just have to be willing to starve to death for a while. Um, you know, you've got to work really cheap, and you've got to have a lot of strings, and you've got to brand yourself, and you've got to suck up to a lot of editors and stuff. But if you happen to be in Greece when the shit hits the fan, nobody else is. Um, you know, I mean, if you were hanging around Seoul today, um, you know, except in Britain, you're, you know, you probably have the top story, you know. Um, and uh, so, you know, you can, you, can, you can do that, but you've got to kind of do it yourself. I mean, the old days of, you know. But, you know, it's always been that way. When I started out, my first job, I was a junior, I think, at the University of Arizona, and this professor dropped a letter on my desk, and it was, in, it was from this piano dealer that owned a newspaper in Caracas. I'm, I'm not making this up. And it said, you got anybody there that speaks Spanish and is stupid enough to work for the wages I don't plan to pay? So I wrote the guy and got the job. And so I told the <laughs> teacher that I'm going down to, you know, and he hit the roof. He said, you're fucking out of your mind. You're going to die in a ditch with, you know, saliva coming out of your mouth like everybody that doesn't finish college and, you know, this kind of stuff. But like, here I was, I was like 12 or whatever I was then. And it was the first time that there'd been a Democratic change of presidents in Venezuela. The old Romulo Betancourt, this kind of old dwarf-like guy, had been replaced by a guy named Raul Leone. So we're at Miraflores Palace. It's a couple of us reporters. There weren't many people in the press corps back then. But he goes out on the balcony to be, you know, to meet his cheering people. And for some reason, I get pushed out behind him. And so here's me, you know, being, you know, inaugurated president of Venezuela along with Raul Leone. <laughs> and I'm thinking, shit, if you're going to assassinate this bastard, please wait, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, it was really heady stuff for a kid, you know. And it was like, you know, I hadn't finished school. And I went back and did it and stuff and went through the other way of the AP and went up the, the, the normal way. But um, you can do it. Well, I was thinking when I, I was asked to moderate this that... <coughs> Presumably, there would be a number of people in the audi audience who are wannabes, or ho hopefully. I notice there are a few of uh, uh, the other end of the age spectrum. But So between the three of us, <laughs> you've got here well over 100 years of, of real... You've got 100 years with each one of us. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> shoe, le Order. shoe leather Order. experience in the field as, as an ace foreign correspondent for a, a, one of the world's best newspapers as a uh, lifelong uh, special correspondent for uh, the, the world's or one of the world's greatest news, news agencies I yeah it is yes yeah. absolutely or, or as a, uh, a correspondent for television like myself so I would suggest we're here to, to, let you, to answer your questions, everything you wanted to know about being a foreign correspondent, anything you want to know about the news, far away. <coughs> do, you think nowadays that you're kind of, do you think nowadays that you're kind of expected to be um, um, 
do all mediums, cover all mediums. So you can't just be a print journalist anymore. You've got to be able to do film and radio and TV and everything. Right, or do you well think <laughs> it's still valid to kind of stick to one specialism? Let me twist that question, or the, the, uh, the answer is obvious, but let, let me twist that question around again to throw it to uh, John Swain. Could you have done, <coughs> back in your Indochina days, the sort of things that are expected of young journalists now where you have to uh, tweet and blog and, and film. And 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 I did do photographs. Right, um, of course. And uh, As did but, that, but that was that was I mean that was frowned on in those days by uh, by the picture desks back in back in London because it was very unionized and pe pencil pushers like myself were not expected to take photographs because photographers it was depriving photographers of jobs. So in a sense there's you know, there's been I, a big unless you happen on a flaming mug or something. But exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, yes, I did do photographs, but I think taking photographs and writing itself, I mean, I'm talking about still photographs, first of all, um, is, is, is also tricky because when you should be taking a photograph, you're actually writing in your notebook, and when you're writing in a notebook, you you're should be taking a photograph. And I was very privileged at one time working for a weekly paper, so I could, I could uh, if I was, I could plan the photographs to go around a piece because I'd have several more days. So I mean, <coughs> that, that was possible. And I have that was I've also done some video stuff, but not 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 in not, not in those days. Um, so I I was interested in experimenting, but I think you have really there's no point in doing it all badly. I think you've got to make a real you've got to make a, you've got to drive for one thing first of all to try and write well to try and be a good reporter, and then you can pick up these other things. But you should have really one which is good. But the luxury of Doing one thing well and, and, and in depth uh, isn't really enjoyed by many foreign correspondents anymore, except those who work for a magazine or. But you know, we, we got to push for that because I mean, the, the thing is, it's like you can't. I mean, more is less. Less is more. Less is more. Um, you know, you can't do all these. I mean, I remember, for example, when Mobutu fell. Um, John and I both happened to be, we were, it didn't happen to me, it was a great story, and, and I, that was my first place to work, the Congo, and I was very happy to see the, the old bastard go. But when he actually went, I don't know if you remember these, it was on the banks of the river, and you know, you really had to follow that story carefully. You couldn't run around taking pictures, besides if you took pictures, you'd be you spend half your time at the police stations. But um, there was a press conference on the river, and you know, nobody knew what was happening with Mbutu, you know, if he was going to go or not go. And and one of his ministers stands up and he starts reading from a prepared text and stumbling over it. And I'm thinking, oh Christ, right away. And I'm listening to him and I'm listening to him and I'm saying, holy shit, he just said the boot is gone and it's over. So I looked at John and I said, did you hear what I just heard? And you said yes. And um, and I filed a bulletin. You know, I phoned a bulletin. I mean, those are the good old you know, the days you could actually. I phoned New York and just dictated a bulletin. The boot is gone. And of course, my AP colleague who was down back at the hotel was having shit fits because you know, she, you know, it wasn't on paper, and there was no backup, and there was no. I just heard it. I mean, I could, I could, I just heard the penny drop, and then I checked it with someone I trusted, and I looked at it, and then went out, and you could kind of see it filter through. But you know, and, and then Kabila's guys started coming in, and um, you just had to be out in the store. You couldn't be up taking pictures. I mean, I was cowering behind this. This market stall, I remember, and Kabila's troops were coming in, Mabuda's guys were leaving, everybody was shooting, there was gunfire all over the goddamn place. And I'm phoning New York again. I mean, you can get through on a cell phone. And the kid on the desk is taking the story, and he's saying, well, you know, he's, let me get this right. How do you spell that? I'm saying, could you Usual hurry it up spelling. a little bit? Usual spelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> could you pick it up a bit? And I said, well, you know, no, I have to get this right. And I said, well, he says, well, what's that noise in the background? And he says, and I said, gunfire. And he says, well, isn't it dangerous? I said, not for you, you little fucker. Hurry <laughs> up. <laughs> you know, but, um, <clears throat> but no, but you, I mean, it's not a question of experience. It's a question of getting it. I mean, the best guy in the first Gulf War was Tony Horwitz. He was like the kid then for the Wall Street Journal. But he got himself in. He worked, you know, he figured out what to do. He jumped in with the Egyptians. He got into Kuwait ahead of time, with all the people cheering. It's all a question of being professional, you know, figuring it out, um, you know, taking a few chances, but not dumb ones. That can be any age, but you need training, you need your background. But also in answer to the question, unless you can do all platforms and, and uh, all, all media, your chances of getting a job nowadays are, are, are severely limited. In the back.
Um, hello. Um, I don't suppose you saw in, in, the, in the Independent this morning, um, I think it was Patrick Coburn wrote a piece um, yeah, I about embedded, it up about in case asked embedded about it. reporting. <laughs> I wanted to hear your opinions on the state of embedded reporting and frontline reporting now um, and as a response to that criticism. He was quite critical of embedded reporters as being shepherded around by the military, especially in the US. No, he was um, absolutely right. He was absolutely opinions. right. In fact, his last paragraph, um, um, oh, I'm showing off. I don't have it. Uh, no, I do. Um, it's called yeah, a distorted view of war. And he was actually pretty nice about the embeds because you know there are certain things. I mean, there's three war ways to cover a war. You, you've got the soda straw view, you know, which is the embed. It used to be the pools. I mean, the pools in the first round of the, of the Gulf War were ridiculous. But the embeds. You can get a really good close look if you know what to do and how to, you know, and, and, you know, this thing about minders all the time, once fighting starts, if you really get into trouble, they, those guys have other things to do, they're not going to watch you. But you get the soda, the, you know, the soda straw breed, you can't get out and talk to the civilians, you just run over, you can't get the background, and, you know, you're there. Um, you know, then you need the backup, the, the, the big desk stuff. Um, but then you need the ability to move around the battlefield and actually just do it the way, you know, reporters kind of do. But um, are you saying that what, what, what Patrick says at the end of this piece is right. He says, nonetheless, perhaps the most damaging effect of embedding is to soften the brutality of any military occupation and underplay the hostile local response to it. Above all, the very fact of a correspondent being with an occupying army gives the impression that the conflict in Iraq, uh, the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, countries which have been <coughs> endured wars, 30 years of crisis and warfare, can be resolved by force. I mean, you add a zero to the 30, and or two zeros, um, and, and there you have it. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with that last paragraph, but I think, I mean, there is a place, as Mort says, for, <coughs> for, in, for being embedded. Um, uh, there's a uh, in the first Gulf War, for example, I was uh, where it was incredibly restricted. Um, I managed to fight myself, fight my way into a, into a pool of reporters who were in the Dharan Air Base when the uh, um, the air war started on on, on on Iraq, and this is in the first World Gulf War in the 90s, um, which enabled you to debrief pilots coming back from their airstrikes, well, which is a perfectly valid thing to do, um, and. Um, after three weeks of that, I got myself out and became a, what, the, what the Americans disparaging called unilaterals, which meant you wandered around yeah. trying to pick up the stories yourself. Um, I think yeah, I, I think they they, they interlock, um, and a good reporter, if he's in, embedded, should not should be able to see through the the bullshit that's around. And as, as Mort says, you know, uh, when the fighting starts, um, the, the minders are just too busy to, uh, to be attentive, and the soldiers generally are very, very cooperative. They want their story told. You know, they don't want to die for nothing. They don't, you know, <coughs> they, 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 the ordinary soldier wants, uh, wants the story told, and, but you only see it, the war from that prism, um, and that's why it's important to be out, out and about as well, and, and do them both. Gentlemen, the third vote from the back. <coughs> um, are you finding that younger reporters that you are coming into contact with are all coming from the same social strata? And if so, what sort of effect do you think that's having on the capability of them to report <coughs> in general? You know, good that's question. a really good question. There, in the, there's a chapter on, um, on, on photography. Um, I think Snappers is in the title, and there's a long rap by Gary Knight, um, who if you don't know Gary, you should. We were last year, in fact, when we launched Dispatches, and please don't ask me about it. Um, but um, um, he's got a long thing about <coughs> exactly that, that, you know, each of the photographers in Vietnam, you know, you can kind of see where they came from and what their background was, Philip Joan Griffith and, you know, the different kinds of things. <coughs> and these days, Kids growing up just don't have the kind of fight and conflict that you had in post-war times, or the kinds of troubles you had to. to and life is pretty comfortable. And so, certainly my students in Arizona, um, I got. Um, I mean, they just they don't get it. And I mean, I, I did an exercise. Um, I mean, every once in a while, you know, if they stop being, you know, if they come late to class or something, I just I put on a helmet and a flag vest and I walk in and you know I'm Colonel Boat Chitlin I'm here to brief you media pukes you know and, uh, and they're all like this but you know two of them 
turned in a, you know, then I asked them to write something. And two of them turned in something they spelled kernel like it was microwave popcorn. <laughs> um, you know, that's scary shit. Um, so I think a lot of people love the idea of this foreign correspondent notion and it's romantic and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, and you could live a pretty good life as a corresp foreign correspondent and, you know, you're only could. real. Could. Yeah, could, could. Beats working. Yeah, well, but I mean in terms of danger. I mean, you know, the, you know, you're, you, you can get spend an entire career and you're the worst danger is a bad oyster in Paris, you know. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you got to be ready for a lot of things, and I don't think a lot of them are. I don't think they realize. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, gentleman on the aisle. That's a question for John. Um, uh, why, are, why are our editors interested less in foreign news than they used to be? Is it just a question of money or is it something else? Um, I think there are various reasons. It's certainly a question of money. Um, <laughs> it's the increased competition from, um, f from all these news, news sources the, 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 the global world, the village we now live in, um, and the, the, rise of c the rise of celebrity journalism, um, which, which means that uh, British newspapers sometimes are not interested in a foreign story unless it's Brits and shit, which is often being flung at me. I mean, I'm, I'm abroad, and uh, my foreign editor sometimes m would say, well, you know, are there any Brits involved? I mean, that's the whole thing revolves around Brits. Um, and that was not the way I grew up, actually. I mean, I, I was very dismissive of some stories when I was um, living in the Far East and asked to write that sort of piece because I thought, you know, I'm here as a foreign correspondent. I'm interested in what's going on in the foreign land. Um, I'm reporting. Uh, I suppose that's a bit grand to say. Um, we're, all, uh, we're, all, we're all on the planet together. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, the money factor, the, the, the ease with which foreign news is, comes back on television um, and, is, and is seen, um, it's, it's, it's had a leveling process, which means that, uh, you know, what happens in Manchester can be very similar to what happens in Grenoble or, or whatever. And, s and some of the fascination for foreign par parts has gone out. I mean, it has gone away. It's so that, you know, you, you now get, for example, <coughs> tourists who go to Bangkok for three weeks and then they write a book about it as if they'd really traveled. I mean, travel has just changed so much, and I think that's reflected in in how foreign, foreign editors operate as well. Yeah, I think it's, re it's reflected certainly in America and certainly in, uh, in television news in, in the race for ratings. Uh, <coughs> if you take a folk, and, and you know, all, most of the television companies use focus groups, use, uh, use consultants. If you ask a focus group, are you interested in a story about a place that you've never heard about? Of course not. Yeah. You have to make them interested. Mm. You have to you have to sell foreign news. You have to push it, and uh, and any story, no matter where it's from, if it's if it's done well enough, <coughs> can can be compelling. But it's really an uphill battle right now. The the American television networks have almost completely demobilized. CBS, my my mm. old uh, network, has a couple of correspondents in London. Has a woman in. Uh, uh, Beijing and between here and there, that's it. That's it. They just they had one guy part time in uh, on the continent and and he's gone. Uh, there's nobody there. But you know the thing is, and, and sort of what I'm teaching the students all the time, and I'm I'm always talking about these cultural bridges. And I, I've got a chapter in this book in, about called cultural bridges, and it starts out. I mean the idea is exactly as John says. We're not writing about for Americans anymore, Brits or or you know or. You know, if you're writing for the Bali Weekly for Balians, you know, it's, if you were lucky, your byline is Ahmed O. Goldberg, Juan Gonzalez. Um, take it from a guy named Rosenblum. However you sign your copy, someone will make assumptions and look for hidden motives or biases. Understand this, deal with it, then ignore it. Foreign correspondents have belief systems, political leanings, and inner complex workings shaped by family, friends, and societies in which they're raised. To do the job right, we each have to take stock of these various elements, box them, and put them away as best you can. You've got to write the stories, especially now with the net. Um, you know, I mean, translate stories for you, and so all those really wonderful, long, boring stories in the German press that, that are really good. Um, you can read; I can read them now. You know, um, and if somebody comes up with something good anywhere, and so stories have got to, you know, and and you know, 
all human beings, I mean, we always make a big deal about the differences, but all human beings, you know, they got different hardware, but their software, or the other way around, different software, but their hardware down deep is all the same. I mean, you know, mothers all want something better for their kids, you know, fathers want, you know. And so if you can hit that element and you can make those across those bridges and, 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 and bring stories from one place to another, um, then stories become much more interesting. Hmm. In the late 60s, um, uh, when I was living in Paris before I went to Vietnam, the Daily Mirror had four correspondents in Paris, which was one more than the Daily Telegraph. Mm -hmm. And that was because <coughs> Brits treated France very much as a foreign country. I mean, they hardly had, many of them hadn't traveled there unless you, were, unless you had money. Um, so it was a voyage of discovery for, um, for, for ordinary Brits to find out about frogs and legs and all that sort of stuff. So that's why the Mirror had four, four correspondents. But it was a prestige <coughs> thing as well. And I think, you know, newspaper pr proprietors uh, used to want to have uh, big foreign coverage because you, when, they were, when their newspapers were rich, or they were rich because it gave, gave prestige to their newspapers. Um, but as, as the money has declined, the correspondence of the foreign coverage has declined, and it's very, it's, it just happens more rarely now. Well, the, yeah. CBS bureau, the CBS Bureau had more people than the Elysee Palace, you know, well, I mean, and better wine. <laughs> well, and let me tell you, I, when I, I started out working for a newspaper, the Baltimore Sun, that was something like that, you, uh, <coughs> you flew. I, I left Baltimore where I'd been making, I think, it was $75 a week uh, uh, <coughs> before tax. And I, I suddenly, as a foreign correspondent, I flew first class. Wow. I stayed in the Crillon in Paris. Uh, wow. uh, I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't bore you with all this, but it, it, it was a marvelous world. And uh, I had a foreign editor who said, you know, you know more about, you're a smart young man, you'll know more about what's going on there than I do. They didn't even have, no, it was the managing editor, I'm sorry, we didn't even have a foreign editor. Mm. Uh, so, and they printed everything you wrote. It, it well, you know, there's got to be middle ground. There, there used to be, I mean, the TV guys all had this saying, you know, no, nobody ever went down the fall saving the company money. You know, you, you no. did what you had to do to cover the story. Well, we often overdid it. TV really overdid it. But um, well, well, let, me, let me tell you a story. I, I once, I, even I was appalled because yeah. I had originally been a naval officer and I, I you know, that I, I thought, and, and then I worked for a newspaper where you had to, to give the old pencil into the managing editor's uh, secretary, the stub of the pencil yeah, before you got yeah, a new yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. And I was appalled at how much we were spending on Lear Jets in one time. Yeah. What not? I was, was in uh, Rome at the time. I sent a telex to the foreign editor with a little list of things I thought we could do to save money, and the answer snapped back Fenton. You're in the news gathering business, not the money saving business. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, as long as you were sensible about it. Um, <coughs> You know, you spent the money. You had to get into the story. You had to get back. I mean, you, I mean, my kids. Once again, my students. I, I always make them read, actually read and, and touch the New York Times. As you know, it's kind of a, a daily thing to talk about. And there's this story from Guinea Bissau, and so I'm saying, we guys know anything about it? And, and so, well, there's two bylines. There's no dateline, which means there's no reporter uh, there. They're not there yet. So you see Alan Cowell's name. You know, he's going to be in Paris because he's not feeling real good. But he's but he's been in Africa since Reuters in the '60s. Uh, so he knows the story. And you see Lydia Polgren's name, so you know that somehow, wherever she is, which is probably East Africa, she's going to get there by the next newspaper. But that's going to mean um, she's going to have to fly from, say, Nairobi to London to Lisbon to Guinea-Bissau, possibly, you know, buy her way onto some kind of flight or some shit like that, and she'll be there in 24 hours. But you ask why you want your news for free? You know, you know who play, uh, that's 10000 bucks that plane ticket alone, you know. So that's another issue, whole other issue. This can news be free, but but um, but that's one of the problems is because everybody thinks, oh, it's just a bunch of words. You know, I mean, you just pay a bunch of stringers to give us a bunch of words, and we shoot it around the ads like roofing insulation. Um, but it's not what John's talking about. It's not what either one of us are talking about. News is a real thing. I mean, I just did a blast. I sent around of the difference between people who actually go out and cover stories and talk to people and use real sources and see things, those are journalists. Then people who take all that stuff and they froth it up into cheese and milk and stuff and butter, that's, those are, they're journalists. And there's a difference. There's a difference. By the way, as a reader of news, I've always had a personal rule. If a story about a country doesn't have a dateline from that country, don't read it. Yeah, yeah. And I would recommend that to any consumer of news. Yeah, well, don't waste your time. Um, lady in the back, and then you in next. Hi. Well, 
just to follow up on what you were just saying about news that has to go to, to you have to get it from the source. You know how much a lot of reporters relied on Twitter uh, during the last um, elections in Iran? They were writing their stories based on what has been posted on Twitter. And till now, a lot of people still rely on Twitter as a source for their <coughs> information of their stories. Um, Alan Rusbridger, even the editor of The Guardian, had a speech last week to speak about how much important Twitter is becoming and how much people should rely on it. Yeah. What do you think about all well, this? You know, I'm glad you asked me that because I, I re this one really sends me. I mean, about a year and a half ago, you remember all the trouble in, 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 in Tehran. Okay, so all, these, all this noise in the streets. Then all of a sudden, you know, this, you know, Aganito Sultan, you know, buy your car. You know, this beautiful young passionaria. And, you know, she gets cut down by bullets. Everybody's got their phone going or their, you know, their, their whatever device they've got or camera. And, I mean, this thing is, a billion people see this. This is, this is the shot seen around the world. I mean, Franz Ferdinand gets whacked in Sarajevo and it takes weeks before blah, blah, blah. Here, this thing, boom, like this. And everybody's saying, this is a wonderful example of modern journalism. This is how, what we can do now. This is citizen journalism. This is at its best. Except that everybody's saying, oh, well, it means that the Islamic revolution has started, they're going to get rid of them, they're going to secularize, they're going to do that. It was their Florida. It was about elections. It wasn't about, the Islamic Republic wasn't in doubt. It was their Florida. And, and you know, so if you get the news wrong at the speed, if, if you get the news wrong at the speed of light, you know, that's almost worse. You had a question? <laughs> Have I missed somebody over here? I'm sorry, I'm facing this way now. Um, okay. With less money being made available so that there's less correspondence and literally no time or effort being put into investigative journalism, what do you think or do you think there's any value in the information being made available through the institution of WikiLeaks in the Iraq war logs? You want to say something? Or is it, or I, mean, I've, I mean, think about WikiLeaks. Um, you know, it's horrible. I hate it. It's terrible. The guy's kind of weird, blah, 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 blah. We need them because if the Pentagon's not going to, if the Pentagon is going to sit on stuff, you know, reporters are no less valuable in a war than medics. I mean, they're there. I mean, these guys, whoever they are, these women now, you know, you know, they're our families, they're our friends, they're us. It's our treasure. It's our, you know, carrying our flag. Um, and whatever happens and whatever they do. And whatever you know, they shoot up with the Apaches. We got to answer for for the next three generations. Um, you know, they're there. It's not their private war. I mean, they're not there. You know, oh, leave us fight the war because, fuck you. You know, you're you're you know, this is, you're us. That's my flag. So we got to see what's going on. So it'd be much better if reporters could do it because if reporter, real re professional reporters can do it, they can go through this stuff and they can you know I don't like the idea of people getting blown away because they've been busted and so although a lot of Sanjay stuff hasn't really done that, I don't think. But the point is, it's better if a real reporter does it and, a real, and real media carry it. But if the Pentagon doesn't let them, it's fair game. Oh, it's how you're next, and then go ahead. <coughs> um, David Schelsinger, the Reuters editor in chief, said the other day that we should perhaps be thinking about covering less stories in order to save the lives of more journalists. I just wanted to ask how far, whether you agree with that or what your views were on that at all. That's like asking a fireman if you want to stop covering <laughs> yeah, fires. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Do you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. I, <coughs> I disagree with him, actually. Um, oh, of course. Um, <coughs> well, I have the greatest respect for Reuters. And Reuters has lost a lot of people. And has lost a lot of people, um, you know, with the tragedy in Iraq when uh, uh, the Apache sh shot those two Reuters people. Um, but it's always lost people, and you know the news game is uh, is is is, is a can be a dangerous business. I I also so I do I think that's something which we should be prepared to prepared to take within reasonable bounds, and um, to a certain extent I disagree with uh, the view now, which is quite prevalent now, that <coughs> um, journalists are targeted now more than they were bef ever before. Um, I know that's a very that's a very much propagated and popular view amongst uh, journalists these days, and uh, they're saying it's never been more dangerous. I don't actually think that's true. I think that um, if you talk about Western journalists or journalists working for, for Western newspapers, yes, they do get killed, photographers and writers, um, 
that's often because of the color of their skin. Um, and that's always been the case, or who they represent. They represent the British newspaper. They are therefore part of imperialist Britain's um, uh, ambitions in a certain part of the world, or conceived to be like that. They're, they're British or Americans, they're Westerners, therefore they're kidnapped. Um, I mean, in Cambodia in, in, uh, in, in, in 1970, in the period of about six months, we lost uh, 24 people, 11 in one day. And that's, that's not because they were journalists, um, that's because they were Americans and, uh, and, and of Western nationalities and Indians working for American networks and what have you. Um, and, you know, there's never been a sort of death toll like that. Um, but we never said oh, journalists are being particularly targeted. It was just a xenophobic uh, Khmer Rouge response to Westerners trampling or Western news organizations, um, uh, or Westerners particularly, not so much necessarily news organizations, tramp trampling over, over what they regarded as their country. Um, <coughs> So I think, you know, there are always going to be casualties. Um, so I, I, his caution is, is fine. Um, but let's not, for, let's not forget that in 1968, there were four Reuters, four Reuters correspondents who were very young, who were in their 20s, who were gunned down in Saigon during the Tet Offensive. Um, and the Reuters, the Reuters managers then never said, right, we're never going to cover, cover this war again. They just continued, and I think we just have to do it. It's just important. You know, also, we got to remember, when we talk about journalists, the Russians and the Mexicans and the Iranians and the, and the Egyptians and the people who, you know, really pay a heavy price for this because, I mean, I think pro John's probably right in this regard. I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, a lot of things, I mean, I'd sure really like to know the real details of the Palestine Hotel and I'd like to really know the details of the hmm. Apache attack and stuff and talk to some of those guys. But, but, you know, and sometimes you are, you know, obviously you're kidnapped for money and stuff like that, but you're probably right. <coughs> but... <coughs> But in places like, like, like the ex-Soviet Union, in places like a lot of Latin America, certainly in Mexico, I mean, that's really scary. And I mean, I got to tell you, when, when, when I see a case of an American editor who pulls back on a story because he's afraid he's going to lose a little money from an advertiser, I just want to fucking kick him in the chops. I just get so angry at that because, you know, people are all over the world putting their lives on their line, maybe not more than before. Um, I mean, you know, the first AP correspondent, you know, Kellogg got killed at Custer's last stand. I mean, it's always been dangerous. But, um, and so did Custer. So. But, um, I don't know. I don't know the, I think, I don't but, know. But, sorry, um, but, uh, but uh, the statistics show, in fact, that more journalists, um, uh, and we're talking globally here, uh, are, uh, are, are killed each year um, for political reasons than actually in the war zone. You know. Oh, yeah, no, um, no. And I that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, yeah, no, I'm not. I, yeah, war is, is different, it's, I think. It's, 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 yeah. it's you know, um, but yeah. the, writer's scholars, the, the writer's chief was saying, you know, we shouldn't be going to the front line anymore. Uh, I'm sorry, no, I misunderstood. Yeah. No, yeah. I think that's It, it goes right. with the turf. Yeah. Yeah. It it's with what turf. you do. It's probably less dangerous now because there's some armor around you now, you know. More people are at it, and, yeah. more, you know, and, and they haven't done it before. Do yeah. you, you want Sorry. to say something more? Yeah. Just, <laughs> just briefly, I sense there is a huge level of ignorance in America, in particular about really foreign think? countries. <laughs> um, um, where do you see signs of hope? I mean, as we know, or as, as I think, uh, investigative journalism is not being fostered mm -hmm. by the powers that be. What signs of hope do you have? Let me give you examples other than L.A. Times. LA Times and New York Times, uh, which I don't think are great signs of hope, uh, such maybe common dreams or a democracy now. Which mm -hmm. signs of hope do you have for, um, let's say, independent and critical journalism? You know, it should be really clear that there are some excellent American reporters out there, brave, smart, you know, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, you know, good. Um, and, um, uh, <coughs> you know, and the trouble is, it's not really so much the journalists. It's it's the organizations, and it's the fact that they don't have the the. Um, I mean, these days when when a correspondent goes out, I mean, for one thing, the tools. I mean, I like to pretend I'm a troglodyte and whatnot, but I mean, you know, I love the new tools. I just, you know, you just can't overdo them. You know, but pe people are equipped to be able to actually really go out to a place and really understand it and really get there. And the communications are, you know, we used to spend fortunes on communications. I remember once. Sending a Morse code cable from Guinea, from Equatorial <coughs> Guinea, at a dollar a word, and I almost got not fired, but but racked on a you know on a anthill for spending so much AP money. But you know now it's it's free almost, and and you can get places. But the problem is, um, American society 
you know, it just isn't in the demand. There just isn't the demand. I mean, you can't, you, you, you as, as Tom was, say, uh, it was saying, TV's cut back to almost nothing. Um, you know, the news agencies, I mean, the agency I used to work for is, 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 is fundamentally important to the world, but it's made a shift in focus. It's gone for branding itself with big stories that you'll notice and talk about, and some of them are really very good. But on the ground, um, you know, old friends of mine, you know, I mean, they, they you know, break into tears, I mean, because they're stuck in their bureaus, they can't get out and see things, they can't get out and see. And see, my point is always, it's not the big story you can hang your name on, it's, it's the guy who was in Iraq for a while, you know, and really understood what was going on that could actually report, well, wait a minute, no, they don't really have weapons, I mean, you know, that's kind of stuff. I mean, you've got to know, you've got to see stories develop be before they become stories. I've never covered, a, I've covered a lot of famines, and never one that... that I don't the readers get it. I mean, the people out there, the citizens. Yeah, you mean the now? Uh, yeah. You know, I would sort of demur because I, th I think there is a latent demand out there. Look at National Public Radio, NPR. It's grown by leaps and bounds over the last 20 years. And they do context and they have people, uh, yeah. pe people all around. It's, uh, I, there, would, there would be an appetite there if, if the you need a, a people who, who yeah. The people who yeah. own the, the big well, corporations, who own the news, own the news media, uh, were smart enough to realize that this is almost an elite audience in a way. Yeah. I would be great for advertising. But if there was a way, if there was a way for, say, across the board, without any kind of editorial control, I mean, any kind of government control or testing or anything like that, just across the board to do a tax break for for media organizations to do newsprint to do to do stuff like that to I mean NPR has gone a little more toward the BBC model where there's less government money and, and it's now and now the Republicans are really after the Republicans are really trying to hammer yeah. um, NPR because NPR is good and and it's got a big audience and stuff but it, it's it's limited it's not enough I mean we've got we have the New York Times you mentioned the LA Times there's some terrific LA Times correspondence still but the newspaper has been dead within. It's been it's been bought up and raped twice, and it's changed editors six times. Um, the Washington Post. I just had an, I just talked to the, the the top guy at the Washington Post, who was telling me. I mean, I was just there a couple of days ago, and we're having this, this. You know, he's a really experienced reporter, business guy, and he says, "No, we don't really need correspondence. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, no, it's not a problem because you know we got all these more people out there, and there's so many more people." you know, sending back things and stuff, you know, he, he's not, and now the Washington Post is being covered out of Paris by half a guy, a retired guy working half time in a garret above his, his apartment. I mean, it turns out to be Ed Cody, who's better than five of any other kind of correspondent, so it's okay, but, um, <laughs> but there's, no, there's nobody else, there's nobody else. Okay. <laughs> But signs of hope was my question. Oh, signs of hope. Well, <laughs> wish I had some. <laughs> when there are fewer uh, sort of permanent staff roles around for uh, foreign correspondents, <coughs> what is your advice for um, uh, aspiring young journalists? And is it possible just to jump on a plane to, uh, to where things are happening and just start phoning around the news desks? What do you think? Yeah, I think it is. Um, I think it takes a lot of guts. Um, uh, as it always has done, and uh, as you and you're going to be pretty uncomfortable and sleep on people's floors. And uh, I mean, so there's some very good there's some very good young stringers in Afghanistan, for example, in Kabul, um, you know, who I admire a lot, and they went out there next to next to nothing, um, and make a. I mean, there's a time to not to make a living, but there's a time to make a bit of a name as a journalist, so that you can actually get if you if that's what you aspire to do. So you you learn you learn the trade. Um, and the money, the money is less important than actually learning to report the story. And I think if you ex if you're prepared to do that, um, there are places where you can do that. You need two things: you need to be the right man in the right spot at the right time, and you need to be lucky. But you know, you need a third thing: you need to make contacts before you go. If you think you're going to go, you know, go down and meet foreign editors, talk to other people, hang around this place, just just. Because, you know, you may not think you've made an impression, but somebody will stick your name in a whatever the electronic equivalent of a Rolodex is, and um, and then when you call up, they're going to say, "Oh, wait a minute," and they'll and they'll answer your calls. And um, but I, I think John's right. And I think I mean that's how that's Sounds how Rem 
That's how Remy Rodin got started in the Balkans. I mean, he just, you know, Remy Rodin, who's, who's a really great French reporter, just just gave up being foreign editor of Le Monde to go back to report again. Nick took car. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he and rode a motorcycle and he stole a car and drove in. To Sarajevo. Yeah. You also need, or it's helpful, to have the intellectual baggage to take with you, to know as much as you possibly can find out about, about where you're going and, uh, and who's who and what's what. Yeah, when I, when I started out, I was, um, I was working for Agence France Press in Paris, um, just on the English desk, and this was um, years ago. This was in, this was in the, uh, 1968, and I <coughs> wanted to be a foreign correspondent. Um, so I took the, the August holiday, in one month, which I had, um, and decided I'd go and cover the fr secret French war in Chad in Africa um, for an English newspaper. So I went to the Observer in London and said I was going to go down there pay myself and um, spend a month down there um, nosing around and they gave me a cable card didn't pay my effort or anything like that I was going to do that then I did what I learned I shouldn't have done which is I went around the corner of the Sunday Times which is the rival newspaper uh, and said I'm going to Chad and can I write for you <laughs> <laughs> well, don't try not to do that <laughs> and they said um, they, no, they, uh, so it was the Sunday Times who gave me the cable card the observer said well we'll, we'll take the piece when you come back but they, they didn't have so much money. That's the thing. Sorry, I got it wrong, but the wrong way around. So I'm with a cable card from the Sunday Times and a promise of a piece of observer. I went to that and um, I ended up being arrested as a mercenary and ended up in jail. Um, uh, when I got out, uh, the cable card came in very handy because I could then um, write a piece for the Sunday Times um, about what was going on in Chad. And then I came back and I thought, hmm, that's, that's appeared. It appeared in the Sunday Times. Um, and I thought, I'll go around to the Observer now and do my piece. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, remarkably, they hadn't noticed that I'd written in the Sunday Times <laughs> the, Sunday, the Sunday before. It was actually a very anodyne piece that I'd written. Um, and so I, I, you know, I was very, very experienced. And the foreign editor of the Observer said, um, right, he said, what are you going to write about? So I sort of explained. He said, well, we've got this, we've got this piece from our Africa editor about the war in Chad. Colin Legion, who's a very famous correspondent, he said, actually, I don't, I don't really want to run it. I'd rather much rather run the piece that you, you know, because you've been there. And Colin hasn't been there. So have a look at this and see what you think. And, and then, you know, it may help you with the idea of the story. So he was incredible, you know, and that's how you learn. He, he taught me a lot. And I think, you, you know, if you go out there, there are, you know, one of the great things about journalism is it's a small, well, it used to be anyway, and I think it still is if you meet the right people. Older people, people who are experienced, will help you. Um, and it's really nice to have, you have, ha have that. And, um, you know, and they, they can, um, when I first went to Vietnam, you know, it was full of, it was, there were two or three correspondents there who'd been covering um, all the colonial wars and bits of World War II <coughs> as they'd been soldiers and this and the other. And I attributed the fact that I survived to the, to, the, to the fact that they took me under their wing and told me, you know, that that's incoming round and that's not going round and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. and, and that's vital. Absolutely. Yeah, really yeah, important. People can be helpful. Well, you know, I mean, Eddie Jaraday is, is the really good Afghanistan guy. I mean, back in 79, it must have been, I mean, when the Russians came in, I was editing the trip, and he walks in, he's this kind of golden-haired curls and stuff, and kind of a stringer for UPI a bit, and he says, I want to go to Afghanistan. I said, look, I can't give you any money, um, but if you get your ass back alive, I'll look at your copy. And he did, and I did, and I used it. And um, he's been back there like 83 times now or something like that. Um, you know, and you know that the Christian Science Monitor and a few other things and the, you know and, and he was also doing McNeil Lear I mean he was a, a multimedia guy back in the in the in the eighties so it's all a question of your own hustle a and luck as Tom says in the back hi um, I was just wondering do you think we've talked a lot about sort of imperialism and that impacting on the story I was wondering if you thought that perhaps the future of um, journalism it might be unpopular view with like it's not having foreign correspondents going overseas but it's actually training sort of local local reporters to uh, report and ooh, then oh good question <laughs> yeah you know I missed the beginning of it what it's not the the idea of not having foreign correspondents but training uh, local reporters what, are, what do you mean ah. by local reporters um, people that are sort of they might necessarily already be working for newspapers and press outlets in countries so instead of flying I mean one of AP's one of AP's best reporters is is, is Fisabrashi who's right here now who started in Kosovo and, and um, came up by being there you know and then from Kosovo went to Afghanistan did a shit hot job there and um, when he gets off the desk we'll go somewhere else and uh, 
But no, that's, it's, you know, a person who comes up from their own society, knows the languages, but also has a, a large world spirit, um, they're going to be a hell of a lot better than I'm going to be, because, you know, they know the whole kinds of stuff. But the, the problem is, and this used to happen in Sarajevo all the time, I'd show up in Sarajevo, and, um, you know, our people there would say, oh, God, good, good. I mean, here's the story I want to do, but I can't do it for one reason or another, either because family ties or because, you know, the local this or the local that, or they just didn't have the experience of being able to cross these cultural bridges. And to me, um, you know, whatever awards they give in journalism, when I finish a piece and I hand it to, you know, I'm in Kabul and I hand a piece to Kathy Gannon and she says, yeah, that's it. I mean, that, that's a fucking Pulitzer to me. I mean, you know, if I can come in from the outside and have someone who really, really understands the story, as opposed to some parachute dude like me, um, then I figure I've done my job. I, and that is the main reason. It's the main reason why when I hear a citizen journalist, I think, well, you know, I'd rather not have a citizen surgeon take out my gallbladder. Um, you know, we're, we're probably not a profession, but we're certainly a craft, and we're certainly a, you know, and we're certainly a skill set. Um, and there's no reason why somebody just can't come up and start doing it. But if they do, there are certain tenets and ethics and procedures and, and things like that they do need to know. And training. And training. And training. <laughs> the gentleman in the back. Evening, Maud. Right. Um, what do you think is the impact on foreign correspondents of blogs and tweets? Are they adding to the reader's knowledge of the basic story? Are they distracting the correspondent from researching the story? Should he be putting those facts in the formal story and not in the blogs and the tweets? By the way, Paul Troidar is an old, not only AP, but also UPI hand. He saved me from about 15 really major embarrassing fuck ups by reading this manuscript for which thank you um, um, really interesting question because I've got a long thing with Alison Smell Alison used to um, she's a Brit but grew up in a lot of places and speaks about 15 languages well and she started with the AP and then she was now then was a foreign editor of the New York Times but deputy foreign editor she's now editor of the Trib but she when she was the AP person based in Vienna she got to Germany as the wall was about to fall. And, um, and I spent about eight hours with her and about a half a case of wine one night with a with tape recorder running. I mean, it was amazing, amazing. And we were talking about exactly that, about Twitters and tweets and stopping and stuff. Well, she was at, in Berlin, when the word went around about the wall. And she's paying attention and she's thinking, holy shit, they're opening the wall. And she went down to Checkpoint Charlie <laughs> And the wall opened, and everybody's standing around stunned. And Allison's like this. She was interviewing a woman. She grabs a woman by her hand, goes through. And she and this Allison and this woman she was interviewing were the first people through the Berlin Wall. And Allison says, can you imagine what I would have lost if I'd have stopped and I'd been tweeting and this and that and talking into my phone and, you know, this kind of stuff. Like, you know, I, she was reporting. She was in the street reporting. Well, am I against Twitter? No. Um, you know, am I against, you know, all the other forms and stuff like that? No. But... John said earlier tonight, and he's right. If you're going to really report, you got to focus. You know, maybe you take a few pictures, maybe this or that. And as Tom says, it's hard to get away with being able to do just that. But that should be the goal. The goal should be, if you're a journal, if you're if you're a reporter, you report. You know, if you're a photographer, you take pictures. You know, if you're a multimedia, you multimedia. And when you can kind of fix them all together, good. But if you're you know rolling headly with a camera on your head and this and you know, your duck hunter's vest and everything like that, you know, you're not going to do any of them very well. Hi there. Are we supposed to wrap this up? You spoke of uh, your craft, and I wonder in your craft how important the idea of your audience is. I mean, ostensibly everything you do is for an audience, but I wonder if you wouldn't have been just as happy to practice your craft so long as you got to do the stories you wanted to do and still got paid, whether or not anyone was paying attention. Uh, still got paid, that's the, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> still got paid by whom? <laughs> I don't know, what do you think? 
Um, I think the audience does become important, uh, and, and um, I suppose when you first start out, you get you get quite seduced by the fact you you got a byline and a you know big piece in the paper and all of that, and then um, after a bit, that becomes that becomes less important, um, and it's actually the story that what you're doing, which is obviously to the to the forefront. Um, but we all write for editors, really. In a way, I mean, that's, um, and editors haven't said to me, "Well, you know, this is not what the Sunday Times readership wants." Um, I think I think you feel your way into into what you write. What you write, what you feel, and if it gets a, if it if it gets used and displayed, then it's obviously what the audience. Other people have decided that's what uh, the readership of the newspaper wants to see, um, and then you get. You sometimes get response. You know, you get a letter, a rude one or whatever, uh, <coughs> disagreeing with you, and uh, and that's that's always challenging and worth having. Um, but I mean, you, you're focusing on on your story, and I mean, not, I'm not. If I go if I go go out on on a, on a big foreign story, I'm not thinking um, I'm going to do it this way or I'm going to go there because that's what the Sunday Times readership want. I'm there, and I'm thinking this is the strongest and best story I can do, which is going to illustrate what's going on in the country. You know, you put your finger on a really important point today now with the new tools. Editors and more importantly, news executives can count the hits and determine, can, can immediately determine the popularity of a story. And I mean, when I was writing this book, I talked to a friend of mine who's long experience at the New York Times, who's now a big deal at Bloomberg. She was going out of her mind because Bloomberg does that. I mean, the, Bloomberg gets feedback and you know, they, their news judgment is guided by the popularity of the story. And there are these DBIs, these dull but important stories. I mean, they're, you know, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter if who gives a shit if, oh, North Korea, they're building up a nuclear capacity, big deal. I mean, some of these stories, you know, are like really important um, <coughs> and people don't care, but we have to, you got to do them anyway. And so there have been a couple of cases in Bloomberg where, where, you know, a guy did a story, there wasn't much reaction, he never did the follow, you know, and, you know. And the other case is, you know, they got to really sex it up and, you know, kind of make it more, you know, and, and, and hype the story, because otherwise, then you know, if they don't get feedback, then you know, they lose their position. Uh, <coughs> let's see, the lady first. I don't think you've asked a question, have you? <coughs> Hi. Um, do you think men make better for foreign correspondents than women? Ooh, uh, yeah. ooh, no. We want no. the women. Yeah. Huh? What did you say? <laughs> well, you know, it depends on the situation, but it, in one word, no. I mean, yeah. you know, there's certain advantages to being one or the other, but, you know, it, it, you know, that's a long, a long answer, and uh, one I'd rather not answer. <laughs> I'll get whacked by both sides. Um, now, the truth is, I've known correspondents who I really respect of both both persuasions, and I've known some really shitty ones of both um, mm. for different reasons. But you know, it balances out. Yeah, it's not gender particular. No, I don't see the difference, a except that it w over the years, as women become more prominent as as correspondents, they have to work harder to get to where they are, and they tend to be of uh, sometimes of even higher quality than the uh, than the men. I, I just don't see the difference. No. Uh, sort of getting on, he getting on army helicopters, though. They're better than men. Yeah. yeah. Well, they well, but there's no, th you know, if you have to go to the bathroom when you're Look, if you can charm stuff. the birds off the trees uh, does a woman, then mm. that's... Mm. Fair enough. Use it, you know. Well, uh, the, the answer to your question is I haven't heard shit from anybody about saying little bunch of mad men and not and women, you know, so, you know, at least it's not a, you know, a sore point. I want to ask a question about um, your opinions on objectivity in reporting foreign news. I mean, as a news becomes more instant and easily reported from around the world with things like Twitter, a lot of um, people are now saying that the future of journalism is in providing context and providing um, authoritative commentary on, on a situation. And if you look at writers like Nick Kristof for the New York Times and what he <coughs> does with his column, which is foreign foreign reporting, but in a very 
specific way towards aimed towards a, a certain cause and what do you think that the increased role of that is now that you can get the news instantly from Saul this morning from someone's Twitter do you think the role is increasingly to provide context someone like Cheryl Wudon who is still there I think their Asian correspondent who can provide that context do you think that's the more important role now let, let, let me just intervene for a minute because I feel strongly about this there is the appearance of, of more news being available in all the various platforms that you, you, you can use. There are actually fewer boots on the ground out there. There are fewer people out there collecting news. By, by, uh, by one count, by one estimate, 80% uh, of the, uh, the, the news that you see on the internet actually is originated in, in, in newspapers in one form or another and then picked up by wire services or wire services. That's probably 95%. I Maybe mean 90, 95. There's very little original news out there. Uh, what we don't need is, is more opinion. What we need are more facts on which you can base your own opinion. But, but if the question, but if the question is context, I mean, this is why John's one of my real heroes here, is that, is that you read one of your stories and um, you find out what happened, but you find out kind of why it happened and how it affected the society in which it happened and who the, what the various factors are. And that's a little bit, I mean, what you're saying is right because because if, if you just get a news flash, you know, um, you know, Germany invades Poland. What's your opinion? Um, you know, it doesn't really tell you much. But if you if you if you've got somebody that can then put it all together, so I, I think the answer is you, you need it all. It's good to have the quick flash, but you need the boots on the ground. I mean, there was a time when Google started out. It said 4,500 sources of news. Well, if there'd be some. You, some, have, you have how many reporters they well, have? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. If there was some earthquake in, 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 in Kashmir, it would, that meant 4,498 news organizations all riffing off of the AP and the Reuters stringer in Srinagar. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd be interested to hear from both of you where you think aspiring correspondents should go now. But when I settled off 40 years ago, I went to Laos, and that was because there were no staffers there apart from Reuters and AFP. But now that's not going to be the, a factor, because apart from BBC and FT, there's very, very few staffers around the world. Which countries, apart from the obvious ones like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, would you think people should look at as potential places to base themselves? It's quite hard. Um, You've got to have the money. <laughs> I was thinking of Turkey as well. No, I was thinking of Turkey. I think East Africa is um, uh, Nairobi, or Somalia. Nigeria. Um, yeah. I think Lagos is really important. Very important. Um, um, Rio Sao Paulo. Yeah. Mexico. Mexico City. Beirut. Yeah. Guantanamo. <laughs> Korea. <laughs> yeah. That's hard. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when you when you look at when when you envision the how do you envision the future of journalism in say twenty five years? <laughs> will, will foreign correspondence exist at all? Why don't you ask me about February? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but that, that is a good question, though, because there's a lot of people, a lot of people like to be positive. I mean, I'm, I'm always looking for positive stuff. I really am. And, and one of the raps I really like is Charlie Sennett at Global Post. He says, well, it's all in flux now, and it's all going to take new shape, and, you know, and, and something new is going to come out of this. You know, we're just all floundering around trying to find the right model. But the two things I worry about are this. Number one, that people are growing up thinking news can be free. I mean, you know, journalists have to be free, but journalism can't be. Um, and two, that people are growing up thinking you don't have to actually be there and understand the story, and if you get a bunch of words out there, you're act you've actually covered it. And so you've got situations where people will say, uh, you know, you'll read, you know, it's like that great famous you know, London special going to the earthquake and, and the big revolution in Pakistan saying, I arrived in this war-torn capital today, pick up agencies, you know. Um, you know, just one's presence makes one a journalist. That isn't the case. So, um... There's a famous line by Donald Wise. 
in in um, working for the Daily Mirror back in back in the sixties. Well, I read my forty words of the guys who moved their lunch. in in uh, in, uh, <coughs> in Luanda in Angola, and there was a big battle going on. Portuguese Portuguese fighting, um, still a Portuguese colony, and he sat down for dinner, and um, someone was shot off the rooftop and landed him landed on his <coughs> on his table <laughs> like that. So he rushed out to the TEDx room and he sent a cable to the Daily Mirror saying, a man fell dead in my soup tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Paragraph pickup agency. There's <laughs> 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 that Partington story about this. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a mortar in his window in Lubumbashi in, in Stanleyville and he said, oh, my room is mortared and he gets a rocket back saying, why your room unmortared? You know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. um, yeah, but the, the answer is, uh, we, none of us know, none of us know. I, I, my fear is that we're losing the craft. I mean, you know, I, I live in France and I'm seeing all these different old, you know, skills and metiers and things that are disappearing because people just aren't, old people aren't teaching the new people. And it's not that old people do it better, but you have to have a, a handover to, and then you have to have, and it's not the journalists, as I said, it's, it's, it's the structure. There has to be money for them and a market for them. So you can go either way. Well, I, I just and one final word for me. If uh, I, I've had a wonderful life, absolutely fantastic. It really does beat working. If I had it to do all over again, I'd do it all over again. And if I were your age, I'd go for it. I'd, I'd, there'll, there'll be a need for you somehow, or no matter what the platform, no matter how you report. There's a need for information, uh, and journalists will still be doing it 25 years from now. I won't be around. I don't know. I don't know what form that the journalism will take, but the basic craft is something we really can't do without. You know, if you're talking about yourself or one person, you know, it's like parking space. If you want one parking space, you'll find it. So if you're talking about your own career, you'll be fine. You, you will be fine if you've got the, you know, if you if you got the curiosity and the drive. Tom's right. You will. There'll be there'll be space for you now and in 25 years and in 100, 100 years. How big the overall structure is, that's the part that we don't really know about. But yeah, you can do it. <laughs> Lady in the middle. Thank you. Um, I'm hearing mixed signals from your talk. One is that you've learned most from your practical experience in the field, but on the other hand, you are a teacher of journalism. Uh, you're talking not about, really. I just, you know. uh, but you're talking about it's important to pass on the trade. Ah, uh, yeah, but so not necessarily as a teacher. I mean, because the way John does it is the same. I mean, anybody out in the field is, is more valuable than in a classroom. Okay, because uh, I just wanted to know how how much do you value kind of journalism as a course or taught in university? What, what value would you attribute to that? Well, well, I, I mean, that's why I wrote this book. I mean, I, I I could not find a text. I could not find anything that would actually prepare kids to, for the reality. And so, I mean, I just started saying, I mean, like I say, this is the little thing, I, the thing I wish I had in my pocket. And I, I mean, it's like, it would be like if they were out on an assignment next to me and I'd say, okay, you know, there's no movement up this road and there hadn't been for a while, so stay the hell off it. You know, little things like that, you know. And, um, or, you know, Ed Cody's got the best line in the book. Um, I've got a, a chapter on interviewing techniques. And Cody says, yeah, simple, shut the fuck up and listen. <laughs> you know, um, you know, and things like that. So, I mean, I teach my students that, but, but I only teach for two months a year, and you know, a small group. But but um, but all of us, um, you know, and why, again, I mean, we're all dinosaurs up here. But I mean, you know, you can you can be you know thirty, even twenty five, and have a lot to teach people coming up if you've paid attention to yourself and you've done the job. So it's all a question of seasoned people as opposed to seasoned experienced people um, helping other people and, and what I'm afraid of as I've said before is if there's a break in that if there's too long a period before people can really get out and go where they have to go yeah. and have the freedom to be able to get to the story as opposed to sit in their desk and guess at it I mean if you if you're in Beirut you know or you're in Beijing and you can't get out your front door you might as well be in Billings Montana you know I mean being there is no you know um, I mean, Martha Teicher's got that great story of doing the, the, the submarine or, you know, the, the wreck up here off Scotland, and, you know, she had to go on the air before she could actually get there. 
after it was too late, she kept going because she said, I don't want to report a story I haven't seen. <laughs> she saw the story after she reported it, but you know, that was her own, you know, her own principles. Uh, how, how much time do we have? When are we supposed to wrap? Okay. Um, who hasn't? Uh, did you ask a question already? No, you haven't. Go. Uh, I think I think a simple answer to what I'm about to ask might be objectivity. But I was going to ask what makes what what is news, you know? And for example, the reason I ask it was I was um, I'm tired of hearing very pro-Zionist people saying that the reason so many people have sympathy for Palestinian, uh, for Palestinians is because of um, this amazing media machine they have that make us believe they're all so hard done by when they're not. Mm -hmm. And yet when I was in Jerusalem during Operation Cast Lead nearly two years ago, the most, the most controlled news thing that I've ever witnessed in my life was taking place by the Israelis, yet still people argue that we're getting a biased view from, from the Palestinians. And I'm sure even Fox uh, journalists believe that they're objective too. So what I really want to ask the gentleman on the stage is, what are your own parameters and maxims for ma maintaining objectivity within your own craft? You, you want to do Dixie in two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, you start. Um, Well, I think it, it it comes with experience first of all, uh, a, a sense of a, a, a sense of uh, of balance, um, and uh, objectivity is is not a word I, I particularly use. I, mean, I I try and write what I see uh, as accurately as I can in terms of what I see, and as truthfully as I can, um, but make a story out of it. Uh, Within those parameters, um, and try and put different points of view um, of, of what I've what, I, what I've collected, and um, I think it's important to write with passion, because uh, some of the things you see make you passionate. But that doesn't need to mean to say that you lose perspective. Um, there are reasons these things happen, and what you're only seeing possibly a little snapshot of the overall picture, um, but. And what's, what's one's objectivity is, 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 is not objective to other people. Um, so I think it comes with experience. You feel your way to, 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 to what, is what you feel comfortable and right with, and that is not objective, obviously. Um, but it's there. It's, it's what the journalist is. It's his eyes, and it's his heart, or her heart, which is, which is, which is telling the story. I mean, I, I'd second that. I mean, I think, you know, it's kind of too bad Fox hijacked fair and balanced, but it's a pretty pretty indefinable concept anyway. Um, the point is, I exactly as John has said, if, if you're committed to what you do, um, and it's too bad you need money, because most of us would probably do it without money, but um, if you're committed to what you do, you're going to try to get it right. You're not going to try to sell your side or the other side of the story, and that's your professional challenge, is to try to get it right. And that's why it's important to have people that, that have been around a while and understand it and get the feel for the story. Because, you know, two sides of a story, I mean, I don't know, how you've been reporting as long as I have. I've never seen a story with only two sides. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you, you know, if you're working for, especially if you're working for a newspaper and you've got a certain limit, but now a news agency, and now that news agencies, you know, the 750-word piece or the 800-word piece is now a 500-word piece, um, try to explain you know, the contents of your father's grocery store in that amount of space, you know, and uh, let alone, you know, Israel, Palestine, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things to say, but, you know, if you can stay here till tomorrow night, we can keep talking. So, um, yeah, there's no easy answer. And so you, 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 that's why, I mean, what I always say, quickly, what I always say, it's kind of like the American, well, in the American judiciary, the judge is sitting there, and it doesn't matter what the judge thinks, the judge is takes what comes up to the bench, and then the judge has to make the decision. But a judge can recuse him himself or herself if he's personally involved. The journalist can't. And in America, a judge is restricted to what the, the various lawyers bring up to him or her. Um, so you don't even get, you know, real fair and balance from, from the courts. The French system, where you've got investigating magistrates, where the judges go out and do some investigating as well, you know, that's more the role of the reporter. So, um, 
objectivity, moving target, difficult word. Balanced, impossible. Fair, you know, you get letters from everybody. Um, professional, <coughs> you know, indefinable, but, but clear. But in, a, in any story, you're probably only using, you know, at the end of the week, and I only using about 10% of, oh, of four or, 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 or whatever, um, yeah. you, you, the information you gathered. So in that, in that sense, already you're being selective right. um, to try and make a story. Yeah. And I think I would add, in addition to the, the, <coughs> the importance of shoe leather reporting and a lot of it, and the experience, you need a highly developed bullshit meter. Oh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. really do. You yeah. have to be able to to suss out, to feel, to smell, to sense where the truth is and who's lying to you. Invaluable. Be going off all the time, though. Well, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, yeah, but that's the whole point. I mean, there's a guy, here working with Greg English, um, photographer, great man, South African. He's the guy, my whole thing here is, is, is hearing the penny drop. Greg is the greatest example of a person I know who could just hear the penny drop, either detecting bullshit or knowing something's wrong mm. or something doesn't ring right or whatever. And that, I mean, I, and there was a case, for example, in when we were during the first Gulf War when we had this kind of hotshot Arabic speaking, very smart, very young reporter who wanted to go, you know, and but, and he wanted to go up to Kafji <coughs> because we thought that Saddam had come across. And, um, quick. And so I said, okay, go, but I sent Greg English with him as the photographer to drive. And so they're, tearing along and the Saudis wave him through the last roadblock and they're tearing along. All of a sudden Greg for no reason at all slams on his brakes, throws it in reverse, spins around, gets out of there and by the time the Iraqis whose checkpoint they'd passed you know got their wits about him they were already back to safety. Um, no other answer than they heard the penny drop. Mm. A few final words? Um, all right, yeah, I'll read you the last paragraph of the book. Somebody wanted an optimism here. Um, this is right after Visa, we don't need no stinking Visa and Viet Rakistan. Um, um, if newspapers eventually fade away, it does not really matter. Times always change. Our grandkids will likely roar with laughter at the rudimentary tools we marvel at today. What counts is getting close to the story and reporting it in ways people far away can understand it. For someone of the dinosaur persuasion, I'm oddly optimistic. Plenty of young reporters are eager to pack their cotton underwear and go tell what they see. The real question is whether they can survive out there, and that is up to the rest of us. Well, I'd like to thank Mort and John, and I hope that all of you have learned something from uh, their experience. <laughs>